very rare. I feel like I started song too low, but that one I felt like I started too low. So we're going to start with the second verse. I'm going to give you a note about that. <laughs> Brighter the way grows every day, walking the heavenly way, beginning in a song. A wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can sing. Praise to Him, my King, He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song. bow with me, please. Our Heavenly Father, it is with humble hearts that we come before you this day, giving glory and praise to your name, knowing that you are the true and living God and the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we come before you humbly today and asking you for forgiveness of all of our sins and that you would be with us and help us that we might be better servants of yours. Father, we pray that you would be with us this morning in our worship, that you would help us to put away all worldly, worldly thoughts and that we would Truly focus on your word. We pray that you'd be with Josh as he brings our lesson this morning. We pray that you would just bless and be with him and that you would help us to open our hearts and our minds to your word. Well, we know that there are many teachers here today that have prepared lessons. We pray that you'd be with them during our Sunday school class. Again, that they would teach according to your truth. Well, we pray for all of our members here. We pray for our young people, for Corey's work with them. We pray for Austin, who is joining us as our new intern. And we just pray that you would bless and be with them this summer as they work with the children and the many children's programs that we have here and the things for our youth group. We pray that you'd be with our church camp and our vacation Bible school that is coming up and that you would help us in all these things, that we would be able to reach out into our community and that you would... Bless us and help us to bring your word to those that have not heard it, Lord, and to strengthen those that have. We pray, Lord, that you'd be with our government. We pray that you would bless those that are in office and that you'd be with them, that laws might be passed that are according to your word. And also, Lord, that we would be able to continue to worship you without fear of having people come in and trying to stop us. We pray, Lord, for those that are sick and those that have recently lost our loved one, their loved ones. We know that there are many on our sick list and that have many different things going on, and we just pray that you would be with them, and that you would help us as a congregation here to reach out and do the things that we can do in your name. Father, we know that there are many that may have problems that are not listed on our sick list or that we may not know about. We also pray that you would bless and be with them and that you would help us here to truly work together as a family that we might love and comfort one another. 
Father, continue to be with us in our service this morning. Help us to always be true to your word. We're thankful for Jesus and we're thankful for his death on the cross. It's in his name we pray. Amen. If you would, let's all stand for this next song and remain standing for the reading of the scripture. Scripture reading this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 16, verses 9 through 11. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. You may be seated. To look over this audience, it's always nice to see people we haven't seen in a while. And one of those is Barbara Buchanan. We're so thankful that she feels well enough and strong enough to be with us this morning. And so good to see her and uh, be in, pre- in person with us. And we're glad to have our visitors. We appreciate you visiting here. And please stay for our classes. We have wonderful classes that are provided and great teachers and who prepare and plan and we've got a lot of uh, great things going on that's planned if you'll notice in our bulletin so thankful for those things now I just want to comment that I was able to go with our senior group uh, this past Thursday to Dixon uh, Tennessee to the plantation which is a big place where you can eat buffet place I guess and uh, it was just really nice to be with them to go back and to do that and everyone uh, for us to go and experience that, but I really want to comment on this group because of their their kindness and their compassion to let someone like me to join them, but also what they were willing to do. We, while we were there, we, we noticed that there was another big group like our group that was a couple rows back from us, and that was the National Guard there in Dixon. I would say there's probably 34 of them, and I don't 
some of our group decided we should buy their lunch. And sure enough, they collected enough money, more than enough money, to not only pay for our meal, but to pay for their entire meal. And, um, and that really helped the, uh, the server because, you know, they were all individual tickets. I just said, put them on one and just hand them the ticket and staple it, and it was just really neat. I just want to comment on that again, just what they were willing to do is just, again, a reflection of this congregation of, of just wanting to do good and to help and to, to be an example. And a lot of them were just so shocked and just surprised and wanted to know who we were about that. Who knows? You know, planting a seed, you never know. But again, just a great example of just the little things that really can add up in a very big way. We're ending today on our series looking at godly women who exemplify God's Word, and we've been discussing some women of Old Testament as well as women of New Testament. Women who have uh, extraordinary lives and have it doing extraordinary things, and women that come from uh, hard situations, but, but they rise up to the occasion to do what they need to do in the moment and the time that they live in, which is a reflection for all of us to look in our own lives, where we are at, who we are, the relationships that we have, should remind ourselves, is it helping us? Is it building us up, getting us closer to be with the one important relationship, and that is God? Are we doing our part and what we can do in our lives? And so I I admire these women and how they portray their lives in such a way, in in such a beautiful way to let us examine them and and, and to be that example for us in the setting and the time that they were in. Today I want us to look at the thought of a godly witness. Again, a godly witness. The word witness is used a lot. Can I get a witness? Are you a witness for the Lord? And so many people use the word witness. There are some groups that are out there that use the word witness in their name. They are Jehovah's Witness. Some religious groups have the advocate and have the mission to go out and be witnessing. Witness. Witness to others. Witness of what God has done for you and so forth. And then there are some religious groups that want to confirm their faith by witnessing to others. With so much of this word being used here and there, it really begs for us to to look at what does it really mean to be a witness. By definition, a witness is someone who has personal knowledge of something or someone who can also give evidence. Very important. I think there are a lot of people, and, and, and this is important, the wording of this, there are a lot of people that when they say they're witnessing, the only witnessing they can really do is for the Lord. That's it. Unless they're over 2,000 years old. But there are a select few who are witnesses of the Lord. Personal knowledge, empirical evidence, hearing, seeing, touching, knowing the existence, knowing it to be true. We think about what witness means and the definition and the select few, it brings us to who I want us to think about. As we think about the big difference between who they are, and what these individuals are. Again, I want to remind you what Jesus said to these disciples who had witnessed His life. In Acts chapter 1, when he was, before He ascended, after 40 days in being the resurrection, 40 days walking among the people, He gathers them together and He says, I want you to be witnesses to Me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Think about it for a moment. These disciples who knew firsthand our Lord, 
when they're giving us these verses through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's much more to them than words. Jesus is an entity. He's a person. He's, he's a face. He's an experience. And it's really hard to, to witness to someone what you experience. And it's a lot easier just to convey it to what we know in words. What we felt. What we were going through in that moment. Whatever the situation is. These disciples were had this empirical evidence of Jesus. Had what we, the science world, begs for. Well, what was the empirical evidence to verify that something is true? Here, believing is t- touching and tasting and so forth. They had these things. They had this experience and they shared this. And they became witnesses of of the Lord. Because they were with Him. And they experienced Him. And one of these great witnesses of the Lord was someone who had a very extraordinary life and that is Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene is mentioned more times in the New Testament than most of the twelve disciples that Jesus selected personally. She's mentioned much more than than, than Simon the Zealot, much more than, than a Bartholomew. And so it's very interesting to see how she's mentioned in all accounts, especially tied to the significant event that we're going to look at and what she witnessed to. But it's interesting her story prior to her be, being a believer. In Acts chapter 8, verse, or Acts, Acts chapter 8, Luke chapter 8, verse 2, as well as what Wendell read from us in Mark chapter 16, verse 9, it lets us know the background a little bit of Mary. She had seven demons. Think about that darkness for a moment. We can only think about it. Imagine the torture that this woman had. Imagine the weight, the isolation, her world, not just possessed by one, but seven. I don't know the amount of time that she had this possession. I don't know how long she had this weight, this feeling of isolation, this outcast, this feeling that she's not in control, but this demonic possession was in control of her. But the Bible wants us to know that it was Jesus who delivered her. Jesus delivered her from these seven demons cast out of her. The connection of Mary and what she came from. Mary Magdalene is what we would call in our society today, she is a survivor. When you think about someone who's come from horrific situations, Someone who's gone through uh, maybe a a, a rough upbringing or a rough scenario and, and maybe coming out of addiction, whatever it may be that is horrible, that is, that is horrific, that is very scarring and bearing on them and it's going to stay. They're survivors. And our world, even in our churches, are filled with survivors. Can we not relate? Not to being possessed by seven demons, can we not relate to the darkness in some level of what Mary felt, what she experienced, of knowing what you feels like to be separated, to be isolated, to have the shame, to have guilt, to not feel any self-worth. That was Mary. Mary can relate to that, but at a greater level. But yet, she can also relate to not only surviving, but thriving. Once she was delivered of this, she followed Jesus and, as far as we know, never turned back. Let us consider the things that she witnessed of and the importance of this as we look at this godly woman. Number one is this, she witnessed his death. His death. Have you ever seen someone die? If you have, you don't forget it. 
you don't. I don't know if it's an opportunity. I don't know how to put it. I don't know what you'd say. I have several people, but the most significant was probably when I was younger, a little bit younger. I was my freshman year in college. My grandmother, my dad's mother, battled ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, and the strong Christian faithful woman who'd come to our house and come to my baseball games, and I was in Little League, dwindled to nothing. Weight, couldn't feed herself, couldn't communicate, sad. But I was there visiting with her when she was in assisted living and helping her medical facility beyond our care. I'll never forget her final breath, that long, drawn-out breath. And then, no more. Obviously, I was sad. It was, it was, it was, it was very, 19, it was very heavy. But there was also in that hard time, there was, there was also a moment of peace. A peaceful moment. I know it sounds odd, but maybe you can relate to that. When I think about Mary Magdalene. I think about the other women that stood by the cross. In John chapter 19, verse 25, it says that there was the mother of Jesus. I cannot imagine what Mary, the mother of Jesus, what that was like for her. When she thinks, thought about the cross, that is a much deeper level. But her sister was there. Mary, the wife of Clopas, was also along with her, as well as the woman who had seven demons. Mary Magdalene was there. When all the other disciples forsook him, they left him. They abandoned him. Except for the disciple whom Jesus loved was there. What did they see? What did they experience? Was it peaceful? Was it like hospice coming in and comfort is the main priority, families around you? No. It was bloody, it was brutal, and it was barbaric. Imagine for these ladies, these women, these godly women, not only hearing what Jesus said on the cross and experiencing what He's saying, looking at what He looked like, but also around you and from behind you, what they're cursing Him, defying Him, blaspheming Him. The hatred. Oh, it's a much level for, for these women of what seeing someone dying that day. Much, much more different than maybe what we experience. Something that they wouldn't forget. It's also interesting to note this in, 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 your, in the Bible. Not only in John chapter 19, verse 25, as they stood by the cross by Jesus, but we also are told in Mark's account, as well as in Matthew's account, that, that along with Mary Magdalene and some others, that they stood afar off. Now what's, is this a, no, it's not a contradiction. Think about this for a moment. What Jesus did for us was not didn't happen in a moment, in an instance. I don't know if you've been hurt hearing. Or, 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 I was coming to the building and listening to the news on the radio, and it, there was a story of South Carolina where where, the, where someone on death row is having the choice to uh, by by execution by whether electric chair or military fire or firing squad. And I'm thinking about, for that moment, entertaining, I mean, can you imagine choosing which of the two when you're trying to find what's the quickest and what's the less painful? But, but Jesus didn't have that option. Six hours. He suffered. He bled. He was in agony. He gasped for air. I'm of the belief that they couldn't stand by the cross for that amount of time. I don't know if anyone could. That loved and believed the Lord the way that they did. 
that maybe the, it was too much to bear. Think about how hopeless that situation was for them. You, you, you can't rescue him. You can't save him. Maybe they didn't realize it at the time, but, but if, if you really think about it much later, if you really saved him, you're not saving yourself. Think of how hopeless that is. You can pray. It, it's, it's still there. But I'm not just missing prayer. Please don't misunderstand. But you know that feeling. Well, you want to do more than pray, but you feel, ah, I don't know what to do. I feel like there's more I could do, but I can't do anything. And the grief with that. But in the end, he died. I wonder what Mary Magdalene, if we could have her be with us, what would she say to anyone who would deny that Jesus ever did this? What would she say? What would she say when we partake of the Lord's Supper? What would she say when we're, our minds are other places and not on Jesus? What would she say to that? What would Mary Magdalene, what would she say of any of us who take what Jesus did that day for granted? To make excuses. To push it off. I think she'd have a lot to say, wouldn't you? What she experienced that day as she witnessed of the Lord. And what he did. The second thing is this. She witnessed his resurrection. It's amazing that those that left Jesus, that forsook him, when they saw the resurrected Lord, they were changed. They were changed. And they were changed so much, they were willing to go through what they would go through. Heartache, persecution, violent deaths jailed, in prison. How were they able to do that? Why were they able to do that? What was, the, what was the change? The change was simple. It was the resurrected, re re resurrected Lord. It was Jesus, Him risen from the dead. It was what the resurrection means and, and how crucial it is. It's vital to Christianity. It is the power to show that Jesus is the Son of God. He's not just someone who dies and that's the end of them. He is the Son of God. It proves the accuracy of the Scriptures. That He came and He lived and He died. He was raised on that third day. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4. It also provides death to something we want to put to death. And that is our sins. That is our sinful pasts it is able to do that yet it was the first one the first witness to the resurrected Lord was Mary Magdalene she saw where they laid his body she, she came early on Sunday with others to anoint his body she, again she wasn't like the others they weren't expecting even though he said he was going to be raised expecting it again it was such a hard time for them and I can't blame them because would any of us do the same? We probably would have done the same. She came to anoint his body, and then obviously the tomb was open. And they were the first witnesses, women, these godly women, to the resurrection. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 9, it says, Now on the er, for early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene whom he had cast seven demons. You know what I love about the wisdom of God and how peculiar and how God is unpredictable in a lot of ways? If you hadn't read this, and I would say, who do you think Jesus appeared to first? Who would you have said? Peter? Who he changed his name from Simon to Peter? Would you think maybe the disciple whom he loved? Or James? Would you think maybe his own mother? 
If she was still there, his mother, or even his family members. No, it was a woman who had at one time seven demons. It was a woman who knows what darkness, true darkness is. She saw him first. And that's a powerful lesson. What a tremendous honor. No one else can share that honor. No one else can say, well, I saw him first. No, no, you didn't. He appeared to her first. Mary was able to see for herself that Jesus was risen from the dead. Mary Magdalene didn't need someone to get up and give evidence and prove it through a sermon that this happened to be true. She knew it was true. She didn't need to read some verse in the Bible to say, well, this is inspired by God, therefore believe it. No, she knew. She was there. She had personal knowledge. She experienced it. And there was no doubt. She was there to see what the Lord had just had promised and said and verified. And notice what the Lord did for her. She would be a witness to the disciples. In John 20, verse 17, He says, Don't cling to Me, for I haven't already ascended yet. But go to My brethren and tell them that I will ascend. I will send to My Father, their Father, My God, to your God. Mary was to be a witness. Mary was to take the, the message, the resurrection uh, message of our Lord she was the first to take it, and as, as was read to us, she said, he's alive, and what did they do? They didn't believe. They didn't believe. Isn't that telling of humanity? Why did they not believe? They did not believe because he came to her first. They did not believe because of what she went through, who she once was. They did not believe because she was a woman? Why did they not believe? Or did they not believe because of so much changes that happened that their foundation was rocked, had crumbled? You see, she went to share what she saw and what she said of Jesus herself. And she reminds us that it's words... It's the spoken words. It's the words we read that generates our faith. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing, not by anything, by the Word of God. By the Word of God. Yes, you'll hear that word used some. Are you a witness? Can you be a witness? Well, what does that mean? What do you, what do you, what do you, witness of what? There are many witnesses out there. Many people that claim to be witnesses. There are a group that, that say there are, there are God's witnesses. But that's, you mean for the Lord. That's what you mean. But it's, it's not of the Lord. Because that's a select few. And the, and the, Population and uh, of people. That's just a very select few. And of the few that were able to see, it was this godly woman who witnesses not for him, of him. And the message she shared faithfully is a great example for us. The woman who came out of darkness and into His glorious light. The woman who had shame and guilt and isolation, but accepted and brought into the fold by God. What a great lesson and invitation for us. She is and was a survivor. 
But she also thrived. And she leaves us a lesson. A lesson to know that there's nothing in our life that's more important, that's greater, that's more powerful than Jesus Christ. Nothing. Nothing. Paul would say there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing here, nothing out there. Nothing. You can be more than conquerors. But you know the problem with that? It has nothing on the outside of us. What does is us. You. Me. Because I have the ability, so do you. We can look at God. We can say to God, No. No. Not today, Lord. Not today. What would Mary say? What would Mary say of that? What would Mary say of those who have an opportunity and don't want to do it? What would she add to that? What little detail would she provide? I think she would share exactly what she was told to share. He lives. He abides. He is who He says He is. He is. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And your life filled with many decisions. The most important decision is the decision that's made for you and it really the most clearest and the most purest and might possibly the easiest if you just embrace it. That is to decide to follow Jesus. No turning back. I'll follow Him. Alex has selected the appropriate song we're going to stand and sing and thinking about these women and others in their moment in time and where they lived and their role and their responsibility and how they, what lessons they give us. But what about us? What about us in the 21st century? What about us in our day, in our time? What lesson, what message, what are we giving to those around us? Are we showing that God is God of our hearts and minds and Lives, or is God just like a fire extinguisher? We're going to use Him when I'm down, down low in my life. Well, that's that's it comes to us. That's the invitation for us. That's for us to choose and decide. Mary made that choice, and she made it willingly, just as others. What will you decide to do if you haven't made that decision? What will you choose? Will you choose light? Will you choose to walk and live in the light? Or will you choose to stay in darkness? The Lord's invitation for those of us who need to respond, whether online or in person, is for us all. To examine ourselves. Paul Paul reminds us, examine yourself whether you're not in the faith. Look in your own life. Look at what needs. If there's any needs, do what you need to do. Do it. Not just for you, but do it for the sake of what God and through Christ Jesus has done for you. You haven't been a Christian? Believe, repent, confess, put on Christ in baptism. You haven't... You haven't uh, really lived your faith in a way that you need to live it. You're still living, aren't you? You're still breathing. Here's an opportunity. You choose. You make a choice. And you decide for yourself who you will follow. If we can help you, please come and respond as together we all stand and sing. Oh,
Be seated. For all that you've done, I Welcome to our service. Thank you. <laughs> um, I've asked uh, Josh to kind of, well, it's a little low, a little high there. Uh, asked Josh to um, stay in here, and if there's anybody in the uh, in the lobby in Kidspiration, uh, maybe uh, see if they can stay in here. I got a special announcement at the end of the Shepherd's Notes today, so I don't know, Bart. Maybe you can check with them um, and and get them in here. Uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, number one, uh, as we've said before, welcome to Austin Pierce. If you don't know him, stand up. He's over here. Uh, mm -hmm. He will be working with us this summer as a church intern, doing lots of different things, uh, whether with the youth, with Josh, uh, you know, things of, of that nature. And so we'll, we'll put him to good work. Uh, he's living at the house over here, so um, uh, he'll be around. So welcome. Uh, also, for those that were here last Sunday night for the singing service, uh, it was amazing. And I just want to thank you for, for participating. We had lots of visitors. Uh, we had a great rendition of Amazing Grace by Nicholas. And uh, it, it was just a great evening. And we're going to be doing that more often, uh, you know, hopefully once a month, uh, starting in, if you look in the bulletin, June 20th. Uh, also, uh, you'll notice there is um, a couple of uh, bursts that are in the in the bulletin, so read those. And I will just say that I, I wasn't mentioned in there, but I am a proud great uncle now. Uh, now, many would say I've always been a great uncle, but now I'm officially a great uncle. And uh, my in-laws, who are my favorite of all of my in-laws, are now great grandparents. So uh, congratulations to them. Uh, I know they're watching online today, so hopefully they're smiling and laughing at me. So, uh, anyway, 
Uh, okay, so getting to the announcement, uh, and I'll be honest, uh, it's been a long time coming, and I'm, I don't, for some reason, I'm just like very nervous <laughs> up here today, but I have a couple of slides. Hopefully they will come up. Whoops. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Maybe. No, I'm not doing a song. I promise I'm not leading a song. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, uh, the last couple of, we've been doing devos online for a year now. And the last couple that I shared, I shared about uh, a single word each time. And the first time it was about weight, uh, spelled W-E-I-G-H-T here. And so thinking of Hebrews and the, and the, and actually it fit in Josh's sermon today, being surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And I shared about Jesus and he carried the weight of our sin, the weight of the cross, not just the physical weight, but, uh, but the weight of all of our sin and how important that was. Oh, okay. Second word was wait, also W-A-I-T, and it talked Psalms 27, 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Uh, both of these words have a lot of meaning to me, and, and I, would, I would venture to say to the elders and many of the congregation here, there's been a big weight, a big burden on this congregation for a long time and really probably since Charlotte Heights began in 2007 and and we've had to wait a very long time and I, and I compared that to wait the children of Israel waiting 400 years to get out of Egypt and then another 40 years wandering in the desert and sometimes I feel like we've been wandering in the desert for a long time uh, so I've got these two words here and I'm, I'm happy to say that now I can add two more words here to the bottom, and that is weight lifted and weight over. Now, you're probably going, what in the world does that mean? And what is he talking about? So for those of you that, that know our history and know our financial situation in particular, uh, we've had a lot of debt. And, and we had to go into debt to build this building. Uh, we sold the other building, but we've had this debt. And I keep hitting the wrong way. And in December 16th of 2018, I was up here and I announced that we sold the property at the other place up there, whatever it was, 56 something, I can't even remember now. Um, I am happy to report today, I got notice on Friday, and nobody knows this except for me. I didn't even tell the other elders because the last time I told them, it didn't happen. It was supposed to happen in April. It didn't happen in April, but it's happening now. And I can report that it's not just sold anymore. Wait for it. It is now paid in full. The loan, not the building, the loan that Zeal had uh, set with us to purchase the building, uh, the payment for that will hit our bank account on June 1st. And that will, it's about three and a half million dollars. Uh, that will significantly reduce the debt that we have uh, currently to somewhere less than 500000 Uh We will be able to put that behind us, completely lift that burden, that weight that's been on us for a long time. Uh, I know there's, there's so many things I would want to say and thank, so many people I would want to thank for, for this along the way. Again, it's been a long journey. Um, but it is an exciting time uh, to be part of this congregation. And I just can't say thank you enough to everybody here for your support, not just uh, financially, but that, that was important. And if you go back to the beginning of this, uh, when we started the loan, we were probably averaging six or $7,000 a week in contribution. Uh, last year during the uh, pandemic, when we weren't even meeting for a large part of the year, uh, we averaged eleven thousand uh, dollars a week in contribution from you guys, and we we couldn't do this. Things like having a church intern, thing you know, 
doing outreach activities we could not do without that and and getting to this point all this time it's just it's just amazing and I, I couldn't I couldn't finish without saying thanks to uh, two people uh, my dad and Frank Mayo from starting this merger if you will uh, joining of two congregations uh, 15 years ago right Larry um, and they had a they had a vision they had a dream and it, it took a long time and we had to wait but uh, it's been realized so I just want to say thank you to that uh, I would like to invite Bart and Larry to come down I don't know if they want to say a word or two of thanks and at the end if Josh can come down and close with a prayer uh, and and pray for not only the congregation but pray for for us as elders that uh, we, we've had to make a lot of tough decisions during that time and dealt with a lot of issues and uh, I think that would just be great if you could do that for us but uh, again thank you I don't know Bart do you want to say anything <laughs> We mention this in, in every elders meeting that we have, and and uh, I, I won't, won't make sure we mention it. Steve probably already said it. I, I was so excited, and almost breathless back there. I probably he probably said it. And I didn't hear it. Uh, I really I really feel like this congregation has gotten to seeking the kingdom first, and so just to, so I won't have to be up here to say a, a whole lot. Uh, just like the Bible says, all the other stuff will be added to you if you seek the kingdom first. And uh, the main thing that's want to make sure God gets all the credit for everything that goes on here. It's a uh, 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 bit of you or have given so much and, and worked so hard. Just want to make sure that uh, uh, I think God has made it plain in this situation that uh, he, He's taking care of. So, so just to say, God gets all the credit. Well, I didn't have three days to prepare a speech. It's a surprise. So uh, really, I guess the only thing I want, I want to really, uh, again, compliment the congregation for supporting us financially, particularly during the pandemic. I, I told Steve months ago that I, I was, I won't say I was amazed, not even shocked. I was happy, I guess. It's a simple way of putting it, that we were able to maintain our budget, like he said, when we were not even fully meeting, which to me says great things for this congregation. I'm also glad and proud to be a part of this eldership. I'm going to tear up. I have probably been an elder, which seems like 50 years, but it hadn't been that long. And the group of elders we have now is probably the easiest group that I have ever had the privilege of working with as an eldership, and I want to thank them for that. And I also want to just say I agree with everything Steve said, and agree with particularly everything that Bart just mentioned. And thank you to each and every one of you. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you and just uh, we rejoice right now just with the news that uh, Steve has shared with us and so thankful that uh, this, uh, this weight has been lifted financially. Pray we can get to a place where there is no more debt and we can, all the resources that we're bringing in and having can just go even more so to to expanding the, the kingdom here locally as we want to be mindful of benevolence, education, evangelism, missions. It's just so much opportunity that is out there and such a need. We're grateful for this church and for every member. We're thankful for what they bring, not only uh, just through their spiritual gift, but what they're so willingly to give in, in so many occasions. And many of them uh, do so anonymously. They, they do so with their hearts just wanting to serve you. And, and just thank you so much for them. Thank you for uh, Steve and for his family. I thank you for Bart and his family and Davis for his family, as well as Larry and his family. And uh, to be a, an elder, especially during the past year and a half, is an unbelievable 
thing I cannot even understand and comprehend what local elderships have had to go through. Something that they've never foreseen or thought they would have to do, but you've been with us, you've been with other local congregations, and we thank you. We thank you for your, your blessing and your hand to be on our lives, and we give all the glory and honor to you. We just, we thank you so much for answered prayers. We thank you for caring for us and being there for us. And I pray that we can continue to be great ambassadors of you and be the salt and the light and the city that this community and this city needs around us, that we can shine our light. Give us the strength, the fortitude, and the faith to help us to do what we need to do. We give all the glory and honor again to you, and we pray all these things in your son's precious and glorious name. Amen.